So we're going to talk about a little brand building today, and we're going to mix in a little social media later on. Um, but first, a little housekeeping. My name's Eric Kuznosik. Um, I am a uh, Wisconsin native, uh, lived here about 80% of my life, uh, uh, live in Janesville now, was born and raised in the Elkhorn area, so not too far uh, away from here. Um, went to, uh, I guess grew up uh, with computers in the household. Uh, my parents bought a TI-99-4A back in like 1984. Um, <laughs> So I was like rocking basic and uh, hooked up to the black and white TV. So when I wanted to watch cartoons, I had to undo the computer. Um, but it was kind of my foray into, uh, I guess, what became my career later down the line. Uh, I went to college at Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa, um, which is one of the finest cities in the world if you've never been there. Um, and I was drawn there, and I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding at all. Uh, drawn there largely because in 1994, when I was looking at colleges, they had a Macintosh in every dorm room program. So Grew up as the son of an educator, had a computer in the house, went to college, and at that time, you know, I knew one person in my four years that had their own machine, and they brought a PC. So, um, it, different times, I got a lot of gray in the beard. I guess I'm one of the older folks in this industry now, so, um, for whatever that means. Uh, <laughs> when I got to college, I found this thing called the Lynx browser. Uh, anybody ever develop in Lynx? Text-based? Yeah, good stuff. Um, so I just started doing view source and trying to figure out what this whole internet thing was about and uh, deconstructed and reconstructed some websites. Um, actually went to school for journalism, so did that for a number of years. Went into the public sector for a while. Um, found WordPress in 2010, I guess, uh, as part of a volunteer uh, situation I was in. Uh, went through a life-altering career change and uh, devastating injury in 2012, which I won't get into. Um, go to heropress.com and look me up uh, if you're interested in that story. But um, that situation basically introduced me to my career now of full-time WordPressing and consulting and all sorts of other IT goodness. So um, follow me if you'd like. I'm, this is a, definitely a practice what I say, not what I preach talk. Um, so if you go out there and you notice big holes in my social media and it's like, he said to do this, but he's not doing it, just ignore it. I'm a one-man band, uh, so there's only so many hours in the day. But uh, if you want to see these slides, if you go out to the Why the Fuss Tech one right now, um, hopefully my slides posted at 2 p.m. like they were scheduled to and the tweet went out and everything else. If it didn't, uh, we'll work on that later on. Eric, could you tell me, I'm blind, so could you tell me your Twitter handle? Uh, why the fuss tech? Okay. So, uh, brand building. Mm -hmm. uh, I am not, I don't consider myself a branding expert, but uh, I've helped others and I've built my own business uh, and I think I've learned a thing or two and I've definitely made some mistakes. So I guess that's what this presentation is, is kind of a walk through some of the things that I discovered or uh, made those mistakes and uh, how I got around them or how I, as a one-man band, am able to brand myself as uh, to look as something bigger maybe than, than what I am. Um, we're going to talk about core values uh, for your company. We're going to talk about how to translate that into your social media platform of choice. Uh, but I will warn you, this uh, talk is not about how to use Facebook. Uh, what's the best social channel for your particular business? Um, can I help you with your Facebook page? I, those are all things for another topic, for another session. So um, the other thing I wanted to say is I usually do this as a two-hour presentation to a corporate group every year. Uh, so I've kind of narrowed it down, try to get it into 45, 50 minutes. Um, we're going to fly through some of this stuff. So again, the slides are out there, and I'll be at the um, happiness bar afterwards if anybody wants to continue the conversation. So. And one other thing, there's an Easter egg. If you go to the slides, there's an Easter egg hidden somewhere that uh, I'll just say it's a link that doesn't have anything to do with the presentation. Um, if you find that, I've got a door prize for you here. So first one to, and actually probably how many ever people find it, I got door prizes. So um, add a little fun to it. So um, what is branding and how do you build a brand? Well, it is your corporate DNA or your company DNA or your organization DNA. It's who you are, it's why you wake up in the morning, what you're passionate about, uh, the image you want to show the world, uh, all those things that are kind of, I won't say intangible, but uh, you can't hold them in your hand and it's not a product that you're trying to sell to somebody. Um, so branding and marketing get confused a lot of times. Marketing is a, a very tactical uh, uh, operation where branding is kind of just something you have to do, it's intrinsical. Um, you, you do it, you do it every day, you don't change it, uh, don't change it radically I should say. Um, and you kind of just build yourself. It's, it's not an overnight process. It's, it's called building a brand for a reason. Um, so I went out, and this is where I kind of sound like a sixth grade book report. 
According to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, branding is defined as, and so this is what I found in entrepreneur.com, and I think it's absolutely wrong, personally, um, that it's just a name, symbol, or design. How many people in their business or their organization have a name, symbol, or design? Do you think that you've done a good job branding if you stop there? <laughs> so this, and this is entrepreneur.com. I mean, this is, you know, uh, the source for go-to uh, if you want to start a business. So I thought that was kind of odd. Uh, and I wanted to dig a little bit deeper. So uh, this is definitely part of it, but it's not all of it. Um, marketing is actively promoting a product or service. As I said, uh, you're, getting a, 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 you're using a message to push your product. Our widgets are better than their widgets because, or our widgets are the best because, or ours are the coolest because. That's a marketing tactic. Branding, as I said a few minutes ago, is more intrinsical. It's, it's who you are and what you want to portray. Um, it should wrap itself around everything you do, so your marketing efforts are, are definitely influenced by your branding. Uh, but your branding, uh, it's, it's like a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not a square. Um, they're not always uh, compatible, and, and they're not always mutually exclusive. Um, it's the essential truth. Branding is, is your, the value of what you're providing, your organization, your product, your service. It's your characteristics, the values, and the attributes of your business that you're communicating out to the public, whether it be verbally, uh, in print, video, uh, just the people that work for you, the way they carry themselves, what they wear, how they act, how they speak. Uh, these all, all are things that go into branding. Um, <clears throat> branding, at the end of the day, ultimately, determines whether or not a customer is loyal. I mean, what you're trying to do is basically build loyalty, build brand evangelists, people that are going to go out there and do your job for you. Um, hey, uh, and my business is called Why the Fuss Technical Solutions, so go to WTF for your WordPress website. Um, he takes the hassle out of it. He's a good communicator. He uh, doesn't speak above your head. Uh, he'll take the time to walk you through a problem. Those are all things that when I uh, started my business, I sat around and said, what do I want people to see me as? And that's kind of what I came up with. And I didn't, I guess, realize at the time that I was branding myself, but ultimately that's, that's what came out of it. Um, if you're someone who's driven Chevy cars your entire life, and uh, you see a Toyota driving down the street, or uh, you go to the, the lot and one looks good, um, it's probably gonna take you a little bit, because you say, hey, Chevy's this, Chevy I'm used to, uh, Toyota, it's you know, foreign car, I've never driven a foreign car, how does it work differently, so on and so forth. Um, but if you have a good experience, if you buy that Toyota, if they convince you that this is the product for you, and then you say, hey, wow, this is better. This gets better gas mileage than any Chevy I've ever had in my life. This um, doesn't break down. The, the tires are better, the audio, whatever the, the case is. Suddenly, you've, Toyota has gained a, uh, a customer for life or a dedicated customer, an evangelist, that will then go out and say, hey, I bought a Toyota. Maybe you should buy one, too, because, hey, it's a good car. It's lasted me. 10 years, never had a problem, so on and so forth. Um, it's, uh, it can go the other way also. Uh, you can really turn somebody off with your branding and, and you have to, I guess at the end of the day, understand that not everybody is gonna buy into your brand, but that's why you are marketing to a certain audience. Uh, you're trying to find the audience that agrees or that um, kind of identifies with your brand and what you're trying to do. Um, the other difference, I guess, uh, or the other thing that why uh, branding and marketing are different is marketing uh, is an investment. Uh, you're putting down money for TV commercials, print ads, whatever the case may be. Uh, but branding is something that you're not necessarily putting down money, but it's, it's, you're spending money in everything you do. So the people that you hire, the uh, products that you produce, the uh, quality of your print materials, the, uh, the, the look and feel and the inter interactivity of your website. Um, how are those things all tied together? Uh, and it turns out both marketing and branding should be uh, something that makes you money in the long run. Keep forgetting that I can do this when it works. Um, so how can that strong brand help your company? Uh, if your price, you know, you have a higher price point, uh, you're a luxury store, um, you know, people can get a cheaper widget. Uh, but they want to go to your store because, hey, um, their brand, or they identify with, I, I, I identify better with their values uh, at the higher end than at the lower end. Price isn't as important to me. Um, they attract new customers, uh, so you don't know who you don't know, and you're putting that brand out there, and hopefully you're, you're reaching the audience, the people uh, that you're trying to reach. Um, 
they help block new competitors or uh, people switching brands. Uh, going back to the Toyota and versus Chevy example, um, if someone's driven Toyotas their whole life uh, or Chevys their whole life, it's a difficult switch. Uh, so Chevy or Toyota might say, hey, we've got that person because of A, B, and C, why they enjoy our vehicles over the competition. Um, it, say, that kind of segues right into the next one. An economic downturn when people aren't spending as much money, if you have people who are dedicated and loyal to your brand, suddenly they're still gonna spend that money with you uh, when times are, are tough and when times are good, uh, you can hope that they're there and they're being that evangelist and they're pushing it even more. Um, and they help you create a bigger footprint. So as I mentioned, I'm a one-man band. Um, I can only do so much with the 24 hours in the day, um, but I can make it look through my branding like I might be a bigger agency and then when I am uh, ready to hire employee number one or bring on a partner or whatever the next step is, um, that branding, that footprint, that infrastructure I put into place hopefully is seamless and that next person is able to convey the brand and represent the brand uh, just as well as, as I've been doing as a one-man show. By the way, interrupt me if you have questions because otherwise I'll talk all the time. Um, and there's a ton here, so if we don't get to some of it because we got some good questions, I'm not going to cry over that. Um, this is probably where uh, I'm going to describe this slide rather than play it because I'm on video and it's copyright. Um, if you're familiar with the show Mad Men, uh, I believe, and this is an example of uh, how it, I kind of um, use this to show how Don Draper, the main character, was more of a branding expert than like an ad man or a marketing man. Um, so in this particular scene from the first season, uh, there's a uh, group of Lucky Strike cigarette executives sitting around in the Sterling Cooper offices uh, lamenting the fact that the federal government has said, you cannot use uh, our cigarettes are healthier than the competition cigarettes as part of the marketing, right? This is 1958 or something, so things like that definitely happened back then. Um, so one of the, uh, the other characters, Pete Campbell, who's kind of a go-getter, brown noser, wants to be an ad man, says, hey, um, the, the government says that we can't say they're healthy, but people already know that cigarettes are dangerous, just like getting in the car is dangerous because you might get hit and die. So let's market it as, who cares? Smoke it away, you know, kill yourself. And everybody at the table looks very aghast. And then Don Draper speaks up and says, tell me about your cigarettes, tell me about your process, because if your competitors can't say they're healthier than yours, or their competitors uh, are being looked at as poison, uh, you're being looked at that way too. But how can we differentiate your product from the next product? And what they came up with, if you were watching this clip, is it's toasted. If you know anything about tobacco, it's all toasted. But they made Lucky Strikes set apart because we care about you because we toast our tobacco. It's a process. This is how we make our cigarettes. The other guy just makes poison. We make toasted Lucky Strike cigarettes. <laughs> so I hope that's a good enough synopsis to show how that's basically a branding decision. That we're the healthier cigarette, but we're not saying we're healthier. We're toasted. It's a great clip. I wish I could show it. Um, so then, how do you figure out, before you can even build a brand, you have to come up with these core values. Um, like I said, when I started my business, I wanted to be known as the guy. He knows what he's talking about. He's cordial, friendly, um, doesn't talk uh, way over your head, very technical stuff, helps people understand kind of um, what they're dealing with and if it's a problem that they can't solve themselves, that I'm the guy. Um, and also my logo is WTF question mark. Uh, so when I hand out a business card or my truck drives down the street, um, people think it's something else and it's a good uh, conversation starter. <laughs> it works, um, trust me. It's uh, the only thing you can't do is drive aggressively and sit at the bar till three in the morning because it's right on the side of your vehicle. So, um, so anyway, a lot of people start to, to think of their brand before they come up with these core values. And it's kind of like putting the cart in front of the horse because how do you know what your values are? How are you going to brand yourself when you haven't even identified what those values might be? So. Why does a company need core values? Um, again, they're part of your DNA. That is who you are, what you do, how you behave. Um, these values are fundamental, enduring, and actionable, meaning that they shouldn't change radically uh, unless your company changes radically. And even then, uh, if you've been doing business in a certain way under a certain brand for a certain number of years, uh, if anybody's ever tried to do that and pivot to something else completely different but keep the same name and logo and colors, um, probably doesn't work real well because you've already established yourself. You've established those core values. Um, so after this slide, I've got three or four examples of different companies and their core values. I've been doing this presentation for 
three years now, I guess, uh, didn't even go to make sure that those are still their core values, didn't look up the website, um, because if they changed, uh, you would know. I mean, we would know. They're large companies, uh, and they would have completely shifted away from doing business a certain way into another way. So I'm going to assume that those companies are still using the same core values, and, and, and very well they should be. Um, excuse me one second. Uh, this is not a political statement, the next thing I'm going to say, and I put that in my notes for a reason. Corporations, when it comes down to our people, and that's, again, not a political statement, but what are corporations and what are companies and organizations made up of? People. Human capital, uh, and everybody behaves in a certain way, and everybody uh, carries themselves differently, but when you have a brand, if you have that outlier, uh, that's a really good way to confuse people and say, hey, um, their brand is professional and uh, on time and uh, quality work, so if you've got somebody who shows up in you know, sloppy clothes half an hour late and gives them something, you know, let's just say a website, that doesn't work, um, that is completely contrary to your brand, and that's harmful. Um, so the human capital, uh, you're working with other people, you're trying to attract human customers, uh, selling to human people, buying from human people, it all goes into the, the branding uh, equation because uh, if you're seen as a top performing company or a top performing agency, staff, product, whatever it is, uh, those are things that are noticeable from a distance. Um, you know, pull back the curtain on the Wizard of Oz and it's just a guy in a microphone, right? But how many times does that curtain get pulled back on your business as long as you present it, again, with uh, a unified, well-organized, cohesive brand? <clears throat> So here uh, we're going to have, uh, I think, I believe there's three examples of large companies uh, and their core values. And these, you can go out and find them. So like I said, I didn't check this year to make sure they're still the same. But uh, anybody not know who Google is? <laughs> so uh, just read through the list. I'm not going to insult your intelligence by, by reading through all those. But uh, if I didn't have the name up there, if I didn't have Google, and I said this is a technology <laughs> company, would you be able to maybe figure out or maybe narrow down what brand, what uh, organization this might be? Because everything they do, if you just think of whatever Google product it is uh, that comes to your mind, think of how these core values might fit in with that. Um, for example, Gmail. Uh, I'm sure that 75% of this room uses Gmail. Uh, have you ever thought about some of those core values going into Gmail? Have you ever used an email, a web-based email program that's super slow? Do you ever, um, let's see. <coughs> Great just isn't good enough. I mean, so Gmail is one of those things that you don't have to pay for, uh, but they keep putting out new features. Um, you know, it's something that, yeah, they're, they're tracking your information, they're advertising to you, um, but there's a pretty robust suite of features available just through the basic Gmail platform um, that, you know, Microsoft Outlook charges 100, 200 bucks, whatever it is per month now. Um, so those things are, are things that Google believes uh, you don't have to do, uh, you, don't, you can make money without doing evil, uh, you can be great, not just good, fast is better than slow, all these things go into all their products. Would anybody argue with any of those core that believes that Google operates differently than that? So they've done a pretty good job then, is what I would uh, take away from that. The next one is Whole Foods. Um, you know, it's a supermarket at the end of the day. You know, we all need to shop and, and cook. Uh, but if you've ever been in a Whole Foods, uh, you can probably go through this list and say, yeah, I can totally see how that is their ethos. That, that's how they operate. Um, I live in a town, Janesville, where there is not a Whole Foods, so mm -hmm. I've been to them a handful of times here and there. But I would say that all of those things, as you go through the list, are pretty applicable um, to, to the whole Whole Foods experience. Absolutely, and that's, you know, I think that's a pretty, how many other people have heard that? So that's them setting their brand at a premium price point, right? Um, have you, you've been in a Whole Foods, I assume, then? Uh, had, were you the only one in there at the time? No. So they, they've branded themselves at a price point, and, you know, the whole paycheck, uh, it's, you laugh about it, but uh, people still go in there. It's not driving people away. It's, they've set themselves apart with price, with um, the quality of the products, the... Um, you know, the, the local uh, sourcing, 
um, the farm to table, uh, their part in that equation, that whole thing. So this next one, I'm always curious to see the reaction because um, I'm not a fan of the company and I have, uh, I would argue with some of their points here. They try, but does anybody love flying Southwest Airlines? <laughs> and why, just out of curiosity, why is that? So there's a, a local, yeah, a local reason. There is the you know the, the lack of a, a you know Midwest Airlines anymore. But uh, you said fun, fun-loving attitude is right there on the bottom. Um, they don't make their staff, flight attendants, gate attendants, all that stuff. They don't make them. Uh, it's not a stuffy suit and tie environment. Um, you know the fact that they're going to go out of the servant's heart one that they're going to go out of their way to be kind and uh, put others first and proactive customer service. Are there companies out there that shouldn't be doing that? Um, that seems pretty, you know, one-on-one type stuff. Um, and, and, you know, the, the desire to be the best, uh, all of those are kind of, you know, you should be doing those things. But uh, my experiences on Southwest are probably much different than yours. Uh, I find it to be a cattle call and uh, <laughs> not a big fan. So, um, but this is the way, this is what they've established as their core values and, and whether or not you believe in them, um, kind of goes back to that uh, branding. Uh, are you an evangelist? I mean, this gentleman back here is probably more of an evangelist for Southwest Airlines than oh, no. most people, okay. <laughs> but, but you will stand up in a room of 70 people and say that you love Southwest Airlines, so you just kind of uh, <laughs> I say, I like, I like. like, okay. You prefer it over I the next Southwest one. Evangelist. <laughs> and, and what, just out of curiosity, why are you, uh, uh, what's your attraction to Southwest over American or some other airline? Consistency, uh, they're reliable. Um, they don't make a fuss with service dogs. Oh. Um, so it's, it's great. I never had that experience in the Southwest, unlike other airlines. So if I'm not in the US with Southwest, then I'm actually going to go for European airlines. So you have a, a unique situation with your, you have to bring your dog, and right. some airlines, uh, and I don't, you know, I have a dog that I would love to bring on an airplane, but she's not gonna be a good airplane flyer. Um, so you bring your dog, some airlines are more accommodating than others, Southwest, you found in your experience to be the well, most. They are all supposed to be accommodating, but it's the attitude that changes. So like, for example, sometimes I request something and the other ones look at me and because I don't look so blind, right? They give me trouble because other people lie about their dogs. Sure. Right? Yeah. So that to me is an attitude, and I believe uh, Southwest has changed that attitude. And also, I like their business model. They they were people that when the economy wasn't so good, <coughs> they became a sub company and they helped people to stay on. So I do think that they try to create that model on their business. So it's not just my experience, but it's also I like their business model. Sure. And, and maybe I need to give Southwest a second look because that's, that's a very convincing argument right there from someone who has experience going through their system. Uh, well, it's, it's human capital is what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I think they invest on their human capital. Therefore, the output of the experience is better than when you don't put attention into human capital and people are just tired don't have any loyalty to their own company because they're not treated as such. And, and you know, I guess an airline is a good example of you're always going to probably run into different employees. You know, if you go to the airport once a week on Monday, maybe it's the same lady working the counter every time. But you're flying into one airport out of another, um, so you're experiencing different people all with kind of the same attitude. And that goes back again to their fun-loving attitude, their displaying or their servant's heart. Um, so it sounds to me like your experience lines up well with their, what they've established as their core values. So excellent. And, and there's, you know, th there's a difference right here of branding. So their branding doesn't appeal to me. And I'm sorry, I forgot your name. I saw your uh, speech earlier, Miss Rachel. Rachel. <laughs> Rachel has had great experiences. She uh, is probably the event, and like she said, is the evangelist. So um, either way, uh, not everybody's gonna fly Southwest. So uh, <coughs> to each his own. So now we're getting to the good part, um, the social media part. 
And uh, so we've talked about core values as you go through that uh, and set up what you believe in, how you want to act, how you present yourself. Uh, how do you then take that and translate it into the interwebs, uh, putting it out there for the world to see? Yes, sir. I just want to ask, so you, you just showed three different companies' core values. Um, how, what's your process outside of, I know you asked the self-reflective uh, questions about what you want your brand to be. For people who haven't set up core values before, how would you take those steps to, whether you're, you're a, a solopreneur or you're working with a team, how would you determine those core values? So if people didn't hear that, it's how do you determine your core values when you're starting from scratch, essentially. Or if you have, yeah, or if you've been doing it and you just don't know how to recognize it. Sure. Um, I guess a lot of brainstorming. So again, I'm a one-man band, but if you're part of a team, you sit down, you brainstorm, hey, who are we? What are we doing here? What are we doing now? Or what do we, you know, what are we doing currently if you're in business versus what do we want to be doing? Um, or if you're just a startup, how do we want to make our splash? How do we want to present ourselves to the world? Um, and there's a lot of soul searching and again i'm one person so it's easy for me to soul search right. um, i can't search your soul so in a team i guess it's more of a collaborative effort of saying here's what i believe um, and if it's a team of four people go around the room and say here's what i believe and kind of do your venn diagram or your uh, swot analysis or however you want to do it um, to kind of figure out where the, every you know people's beliefs overlap mm -hmm. and then for lack of a better term, fight it out. If there's, you know, if you, if you got, hey, we want to be the lowest price and we want to be the highest price, um, your team probably is never going to be able to be, like, have a cohesive brand because you've got those differing opinions. So you at least got to get on the same page. Does that yeah. answer your question? So, Yes, sir. Sure. I mean, so could you, as a new company, could you say we want to be the lowest price point, but also the best customer service? Sure. And if that's the way you want to brand yourself, it might be difficult because, it, you know, you're charging people less than maybe what your competitors are, which means you can put less money into research and development of your products, into marketing of your products, into paying your employees. So who here wants to make less than they're making today? You know, so paying people, again, the human capital part, when you pay people well uh, and you pay for the talent that you want, um, that's going to help benefit your brand if you're looking for that top talent. If you're looking for any bum, warm body off the street, um, you know, you're not going to be able to provide the lowest price and the best customer service because that person uh, who's working for seven twenty-five an hour or whatever minimum wage is now is probably not, um, doesn't have the soft skills, the formal education, the training, whatever the case might be. Any other questions before? I think this is a good point to kind of pivot, so if there's, we're good to, to move on. So um, how do you do it? How do you take all these core values, that list of 10 things that Google uh, believes in, how do you take that and translate that to social media? Well, first we have to figure out what social media isn't, because it is a lot of things, but I think it isn't a lot more. Um, and, and social media, uh, if anybody believes that it's gotten smaller in the past year and will get smaller in the coming years, uh, you should probably take another look at things. Um, so uh, when you're, whether you're a new business, uh, you're launching a new product, you're um, pivoting uh, what your offerings are, uh, you need brand awareness out there, right? And you need brand awareness whether you're marketing to consumers or to businesses or to both or to whoever. Um, so when two-thirds, 70 percent, whatever the number is now, of internet users have some sort of social media account, and that's where people are gathering online or gathering in general, um, that's the place to get brand awareness. Uh, Forty years ago, you might have put an ad, full-page ad in the Sunday paper because you knew that everybody was getting that uh, on their doorstep after church, looking through it, um, you know, clipping things to save because there was no internet. There was no um, save-it-for-later uh, Insta paper type things. Um, so, 
when you go online and, and you're, you're looking at these social channels, again, whichever ones are best for your business, um, they're vital for getting that brand awareness, for getting that recognition of, of who you are, what you're doing, what your brand is. So here are all the things that social media isn't. Uh, myths and fallacies. Uh, it's inexpensive. Has anybody, uh, you know, those of you who have a Facebook page for your business, uh, is the best strategy that you found? Just post stuff out there without boosting it, without really any strategy, and just seeing what sticks and what is popular and what people react to? You don't get too far doing it that way because Facebook is a business and they want money. And you know their exchange of money uh, for services is we're gonna expose your message to more people. So if you think that you can get out there and just, hey, for free, we, we're gonna create a Twitter account, an Instagram account, a Snapchat account, everything under the sun, and we're gonna put messages out there and our brand and our business is just gonna take off. I, I don't think it works that way. Um, not in my, and if it does work that way, somebody needs to retrain me on how to do it. Um, and, and, and segueing very quickly into the next one, that social media is fast, that hey, if we create an Instagram account today, suddenly that's the end of our problems. That you know, solves everything we need to do. Not gonna work. Um, it takes a long time to develop a voice, develop a following, um, to figure out you know, best times to post, best times not to post, best times to post very aggressive marketing messages, best times to post, Hey, it's Monday. Everybody hates Mondays, right? You know, like um, there's certain types of things uh, that you can do to build that audience, um, and it takes time. You know, you start with one follower. You know, this whole social multiplier effect uh, takes takes hold. Um, hopefully, you have a hundred followers uh, and then a thousand followers, but it doesn't happen overnight. And don't ever go on Twitter and or don't ever go on Google and say buy Twitter followers, you know, and all that. Don't try to artificially uh, inflate your following counts because um, not going to help you out at all. Uh, fake accounts don't do anything for you. Um, there are people that believe social media is just viral marketing. Um, that hey, I'm going to create this video of me falling down the stairs, and Daniel Tosh is going to pick it up, put it on his show. It's going to have eight million views. Um, has anybody heard of uh, over the summer, it's been a couple months now, and actually he just broke both of his legs, so I don't think he'll be doing it anymore. Uh, the Laguna Beach Jumper out in California, a uh, guy, you know, late 20s, uh, working as a waiter or whatever, just decided, hey, screw this, I'm going to go do what I want to do, and what I want to do is create YouTube videos of me jumping off balconies into the ocean. And it worked for about a month, two months. Uh, and then he jumped off something and broke his legs. And uh, he made $4,000 for all these millions of views that he got. Um, so his medical bills, I'm just going to guess, as someone who's broken a femur before, medical bills are more than four grand in that case. So um, don't create your, so don't go out on social media thinking that you're going to go viral and that's going to be the, the key to your happiness and the key to your success. Um, because I, I, there's a big downside of going viral too, but forcing something to go viral is, is not the way to go. Um, hey, social media results can't be measured, right? Yes, they can, and it just gets better and better and better um, in terms of being a marketer or a business owner. Uh, the, I'm a big analogy guy. Um, again, I, I don't want to talk above my customers' heads, and I deal with a lot of small businesses who they have no idea what a website, how it even works. They just know that they need one. Um, I live uh, in Janesville, which is uh, just north of Beloit, and I use the analogy, hey, if you have a hamburger stand in Janesville uh, and you want to put up a billboard on the side of I-90, uh, the advertising company can tell you how many cars go by there every day, you know, how many between this time, how many between that time, which is great because, hey, 100,000 cars every day, that's 200,000 eyeballs at least. Um, you know, that's, that's a lot of eyes. But what they can't tell you is what time of day they're driving by, if they're hungry, if they like hamburgers, um, if they had a hamburger yesterday for lunch, you know, all these things that a billboard is static, it doesn't change, um, it's there, and if you buy a billboard for a month and after a week you're not getting the results you think you should be getting, try calling the advertising company and saying, yank it down, I want my money back. They're gonna say, you signed a 30-day, 60-day, whatever contract, um, it's gonna stay there and we're gonna keep your money. With social media, you can try something as much as you want, as little as you want, you can change it whenever you want, you can put a campaign out there and if it's working, you can continue, you know, add more money to it, you can stop at any point, you can change your message. Um, I believe on the other side of the wall there's an A-B split test uh, talk going on, which is essentially what this is, is figure out what people respond to and what they don't respond to and go with the more popular message. Um, but all, you can measure all of that 
uh, using Facebook ads, using Twitter ads, Instagram. Um, I haven't done a whole lot on Snapchat uh, because I'm almost 40 and I don't understand it, um, <laughs> quite honestly. Um, and I don't have kids, so no one can explain it to me. Um, so uh, you can definitely measure your results and, and you know, a couple years ago, uh, social media results couldn't be necessarily translated into sales through your website if you're doing e-commerce. But now um, Google Analytics does that and all these other analytics programs that can tell you someone left, uh, you know, using your Facebook pixel. Somebody took your ad, clicked on your ad, went to your website, browsed for however long, bought five products, they exited that funnel, there's a conversion for you. I mean, that's measurable results um, that return on investment, uh, it's all right there, whereas, again, the static billboard on the side of the freeway is going to cost you a thousand bucks for a month. Hope you made a thousand and one dollars, so it was worth it. Um, and the last one being, oh, I'm sorry, the second to last one, social media is optional. Does anybody think that if you're starting a business today, you shouldn't have a presence on social media at all? It's pretty self-explanatory. It's, it's not getting any smaller. It's, it's getting larger. Uh, and social media is hard. Well, I can't do it because it's so hard. No, it's not hard. Anybody can go on there and create a Facebook page and, you know, there's tutorials left and right on, on uh, if you Google it. But it's complicated. It's complex. It's, um, it's a lot of looking at your analytics, looking at your data, um, figuring out who your followers are, where they come from, what time they're online, um, why they like your brand versus your competitor. Uh, there's a lot of science that goes into it. And um, people who are much smarter than me with statistics have figured out ways to make it digestible. Um, but it's still a very complicated process, and that's why there's people out there who are social media managers, um, because the business owner has no idea why Facebook is a better channel for them than Twitter, uh, but they'll hire somebody and pay somebody to do that. So it's created this whole industry of people um, who understand this, and again, I'm not an expert. Uh, they understand it much better than I, uh, but you as the business owner, you as um, the, the, the freelancer or the, the consultant working with a client, um, you can help them understand it using some of these tools, but it's still complex. It's still, it's not easy. So now that we've talked about all the things that social media isn't, let's talk about how to take those core values and, and some of those things we talked about earlier um, and translate them into whatever channel it is that you're using. Um, and I'm probably going to go pretty quick here because I got 10 minutes or so, um, and I want to leave some time for questions. So, uh, and this is from the canva.com design school blog. Uh, if you haven't heard of Canva, it's a great tool to help you brand, um, to create consistent images, um, to make Facebook banners, um, all that stuff. You go on there and they do have a paid account, but there's a lot that you can get for free. So um, this is from their blog, um, and there, you know, each one is pretty long. I just broke it down into some pretty simple messages here. Um, consistency. Use the same font, uh, you know, if it's a website, use the same font families uh, on your website as you do on your, um, your social media banners or your print ads or what have you. Colors, um, routine, come up with a schedule. So if you're going to post every Monday morning, stick to that. So people uh, that are following you and, and post more than once a week, I guess is what I should also say. Um, but do it at a, at a time. Um, so again, look at your data. When are people visiting your site? When are they liking your posts? Um, and use that to your advantage. Come up with a style guide uh, of how you want to talk because um, especially if you're a small business that's growing or you're a nonprofit that there's volunteers that kind of filter in and out, um, people come in and they don't know, uh, you know, they don't do a lot of research into what has happened before them. They just know that starting now, this is my job. So give them a guide. Hand the new guy who's replacing you a, a document that says, here's how we do it. Here's the colors we use. Um, here's what we don't do. Uh, put all those things in, in writing and, and go back to that. And, and you, know, you don't need to alter it dramatically, but just make sure that it's current, um, that it's fitting your needs, um, because a style guide should be a living, breathing uh, document. I'm a former newspaper reporter, and if anybody else has ever used the AP style book, um, it changes, you know, not drastically, but here and there it changes, and you've got to keep up with it, uh, because I had an editor that when you would make an AP style mistake would take you out to the woodshed for it. So um, I, you had to learn that thing. Second one, and I should have explained this at the beginning of the speech, but the numbers up there are just for your reference. They're slide numbers. It's not, no, this isn't tip number 18. It's slide number 18, sorry. Um, so you can just write in your notes. It's slide 18 that you want to ask a question about or go back to. So um, strong logos, 
uh, are always a good thing. Again, mine is WTF question mark, and you know I have why the fuss technical solutions in very small writing below it. So you got to get pretty close to know that it's not the other thing uh, that WTF might stand for. Um, and also, visual logos a lot of times have hidden meanings in them. Um, and actually, if you click on that image in the slides, you'll go to a list of ten of them. Um, and just one example is the FedEx logo. Does anybody know what that? Uh, the little hidden thing in there with the arrow to make sure or to, to show you that they're fast, that they're going to take it from point A to point B, and they're the, the ones to do it. Um, just little hidden things like that. So there's some other examples in that uh, blog post that are interesting that you may not have realized what you've been looking at all these years is actually a subliminal message. Colors, uh, use consistent colors, first of all, uh, and use, uh, don't use a bright red background with bright yellow text uh, because First of all, it looks like McDonald's. Second of all, you can't read it. Um, third of all, people who have need to use screen readers and assistive devices, that's high contrast things aren't great. Um, but then also use, and I know that color wheel's a little bit small up there, but certain colors um, present certain feelings and, and people identify certain feelings with those colors. Um, and I don't know if anybody can see what blue is up there on the wheel, but there's a very, uh, I used blue as the dominant color in this presentation for a reason. Blue is trust. And so hopefully you all trust me in what I'm saying, because if I'm blowing smoke, you're going to walk out of here and uh, rate me poorly on the survey. But um, it's, a, it's a trust thing. It's, hey, I, I, I know what I'm talking about. I'm going to use this color to kind of underlie that. Voice and style. Again, this goes back to in your style guide. How are you going to talk to people? How are you going to respond to your, your customers or people with complaints? Um, you know, there's a lot of mistakes out there, uh, case studies on uh, ways people have reacted to different situations. Um, one of them, which is not the actual company doing it, but if you recall Target a year or two years ago maybe, so that all their bathrooms are going to be uh, for both genders. You know, they're not going to put male or female on them anymore. And uh, people had a fit, as you know, online people have a fit about just about everything. Um, and somebody created a customer service Facebook account with the little Target bullseye logo and started responding to these people uh, on the Target page who were complaining about this policy change. And it, it, you know, it got picked up really quickly because A, half the people thought it was Target, uh, giving them like a you know, smart ass response to you know, their, their comment. Um, but the other part of it is Target didn't take those posts down. They kind of you know, said, this guy, whoever's doing it in the background, is understanding what we're trying to do here. And yeah, he might be a little crude making these comments, but as long as he stays within our, our guidelines, he's all right. And it kind of um, it made Target look good because they weren't just deleting that off the face of the earth. So they allowed someone else to use their style of voice because it agreed with them. Um, which I guess for a big company, you, I, you can't think of too many situations where they allow that to happen. Um, so I've always thought that was a pretty cool thing um, because honestly some of the things people get bent out of shape about online and I'm not making a comment about that case in particular but people get bent out of shape because the sun didn't come up this morning. So um, <laughs> kudos to Target for, for letting that go. Um, and I guess the three things that I wanted to mention if I didn't already because I have my list here. Tone, language, and purpose. Um, how are you talking to them? What sort of language are you using? And what is the why are you responding to this person? Why are you putting this post out there? Um, have it make it have a purpose. Be a human. Um, you guys have probably already all, all seen uh, Twitter accounts, Facebook accounts that are basically auto-generated. You know, uh, you get a Twitter follower, some beautiful young girl is following me on Twitter now, all of a sudden out of the blue that I don't know, and all she's tweeting is non sequiturs, you know, all this gibberish nonsense with every once in a while there's a link. Um, that's a bot, you know, and nobody wants to follow that. You can't interact with that. Um, so be a human. Um, understand that you're talking to other humans. Going back to companies and corporations are humans, people. Um, because you, if you talk to someone like a human being, they'll generally respond like a human being unless they're... Uh, I'm not going to go down that road right now. <laughs> not going to make that comment. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and part of being a human is not using your corporate speak. So most of us are WordPress developers, designers, aficionados, whatever you want to call it. Um, we can get pretty deep into functions and PHP and JavaScript and all these different terms that the average person, they may have heard, but they probably don't understand. So again, going back to my personal brand, I try to talk to people at an eye-to-eye -eye level, not up here. Um, so talk to them like a human and, uh, you know, Make them feel like you 
uh, are having a conversation with them, not talking at them. <clears throat> Limit your plugs. Uh, I'm sure we all follow social media accounts where it's just buy this, buy this, buy this, buy this, buy this every day. It's not the best thing to do. Um, customers want two-way communication. They don't always want to hear your sales pitch. Um, they want to hear about other things. They want to be able to ask questions and get human responses and not just corporate speak. Tell stories. Um, anybody know who Chris Lemma is? Yeah. Anybody heard him speak? He tells stories and he's fantastic at it. Um, tell your story. Don't just post, um, hey, we just put out a brand new widget. It's the greatest widget ever. Talk about maybe why you put it out or how it came to be or why you saw this product or, hey, here's a customer who bought our widget and really benefited. Um, it's a testimonial. <clears throat> Again, that's, that's your evangelist doing your work for you. You're just putting it out there in the form of a story on your blog or on your social media. Um, or wherever you'd like. Transparency. Um, and the reason the McDonald's uh, sign is up there is uh, in 2012, the whole pink slime uh, ground beef situation, McDonald's got accused of, hey, you know, you're using pink slime. Uh, so McDonald's Canada, which is different than McDonald's US, said, no, we don't. Let's show people how we make our burgers. Let's show people how we make our French fries, all that stuff. So they started doing these videos. Uh, putting it up there, Ask McDonald's Q&A type things on YouTube. And you can still go out there, actually, I think if you click that link in the slides, it'll take you to the page um, where they have a lot of those videos archived. But it worked very well. There's case studies out there that showed that consumer loyalty um, and dedication to the McDonald's brand grew after that because it wasn't just, oh, fast food, junk food, whatever. They were showing that they sourced their potatoes from whatever farmer in Manitoba um, and, and were able to walk people through the process. Now. Does it mean McDonald's is the greatest food ever, that it's not unhealthy? No. But at least they're pulling back that curtain on the Wizard of Oz rather than saying, nope, we don't use pink slime, period, end of story. Uh, they showed people, they proved or showed people how they were doing their uh, creation of their burgers rather than uh, taking the, the lowest common denominator and dumping ammonia on it and then pressing it out into a patty. So, uh, and McDonald's USA actually picked up this program and did it a couple years later because it was so successful in Canada. Be relevant. Uh, you guys like going on Facebook and seeing the you know, read more little link and then you do that and then it says continue reading and then you go to another window where it's like this long and that's great if you're a journalist and you got something to say but as a company uh, keep your messages short because you know how people go through Facebook or Twitter it's this it's just going through it until something catches your attention so don't take your time posting a thousand words on Facebook uh, keep it short keep it sweet Keep it to what people want to hear and what they're interested in. And use visuals. Uh, and that one up there, uh, I wish it was larger because that can put you in a trance. Uh, but again, when people are scrolling through, uh, killing time, they're looking mostly for visuals. They're not stopping to see what everybody typed out. They're looking for pictures that catch their eye, videos. Um, so use those sorts of things to your advantage. Um, even if they're just pictures uh, mm. you know, of people using your products, it's better than just a text post that says we're the best because we're the best. Show why you're the best. Show somebody using your product and having a great day or great meal or whatever it is you're selling. Um, visuals are very important. Wow, I got a minute to spare. Um, so thank you to, and this is just some of the resources that I use when making this. Thank you again to the WordCamp uh, Waukesha uh, organizers. And there's my information. I'll be at the happiness bar. Um, I can probably take a question or two. How do you help customers set budgets? <laughs> I say, what's your budget for this? <laughs> and they say, $300. And I say, that's not going to cut it. No, um, <sighs> one of the earlier sessions uh, that I attended talked a little bit about uh, ex setting expectations. And I think that's the key, is sitting down and saying, here's what I can do for you. Um, so if I'm not the guy to run your Facebook account, I'm not going to, if they say, hey, would you run our Facebook account? I'm not going to say, well, maybe, you know. No, I'm not going to do it. Here's the expectations. Um, but here, you want to do A, B, C, and D? Here's what I would charge. If you don't have the budget, uh, can you take out C and we can reduce that number a little bit? Sure. No, that's an essential part. Well, then the budget needs to be increased. Um, and, and I guess the, the stock answer is every situation is different. Anything else? Oh, yeah. I, 
I would say that there, there's a situation where that would definitely be. Um, so you're a, a caregiver, you're someone that goes in, you know, hospice, your hospice uh, organization. Um, you need to be very personal in that respect. If you are, um, oh, I don't know, cleaning out porta potties, you probably don't have to get real personal with that, you know? And I'm not being a smart ass. That's just, you know, there's certain situations where it's appropriate and there's certain situations where it's not. <laughs> I would say it's a pretty good equation, pretty good ratio. Um, you know, again, some situations it might be uh, 10 to 1, you know, because you know that you have a very dedicated audience and that you don't have to keep marketing out to them because they're already brand evangelists. Um, but there may be some situations where you don't want to put all the fluff out there. You just need to get down to brass tacks. And so, again, it's kind of, you know. I don't think that there's a, a so I always say that they're practicing medicine, not perfecting it. And so I think that's a lot of what social media is. You're practicing and if something doesn't work, it's easy to try something different. So I think I got to wrap it up here. Again, if you uh, want to come to the happiness bar and chat for the next uh, hour or two, I'll be in there. Otherwise, thank you for listening.